أن يضرب مثلا ما بعوضة فما فوقها فأما الذين آمنوا فيعلمون أنه الحق من ربهم وأما الذين كفروا فيقولون ماذا أراد الله بهذا مثلا يضل به كثيرا ويهدي به كثيرا وما يضل به إلا الفاسقين الذين ينقضون عهد الله من بعد ميثاقه ويقطعون ما أمر الله به أن يوصل ويفسدون في الأرض أولئك هم الخاسرون كيف تكفرون بالله وكنتم أمواتا فأحياكم ثم يميتكم ثم يحييكم ثم إليه ترجعون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم ما بعد ونسجن أبيوان السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته we have a tall order before us today, a few ayat that I'd like to try and cover. I don't want to rush through any of them. So inshallah, my intention is hopefully we can finish them today. If not, inshallah, we try to wrap them up by tomorrow. Allah Azza wa Jal continues the subject after the description of Jannah yesterday. Uh, back to the Qur'an. The, the ayah before was actually about the Qur'an also and Allah Azza wa Jal had given the challenge. In kuntum fi mimma nazzalna ala abdina fa'tu bi suratin min mithli. If you're in any doubt about what we've sent down on our slave, then produce anything of its like, anywhere near remotely of its like, or its likeness. Uh, now, on the one hand, the challenge was you can't produce anything like the Quran. But just because they couldn't produce anything like it and they t- couldn't come up with an alternative doesn't mean that they're going to stop attacking the religion. So if you, can't, if you can't provide an alternative, the only thing left for you to do is now attack what they have, criticize what they have. Yeah, fine, I won't meet the challenge, but come on, it's got so many problems. So actually you'll find this second tier still existing today. And what's that second tier? Well, we can't produce something like the Qur'an, so let's just keep on criticizing it, finding things in it that we can poke fun at, or say, what is, how does this make any sense, how does that make any sense? That, that mentality still exists till, to this day. One more thing to say, actually, you know, in recent times, actually this, is, this happened, in my experience, this happened when I was a college student, um, and I was just learning, just starting to learn some Arabic. Uh, and I remember, this is so old, this is when the internet was new. So this is like back when GeoCities pages were popular, for some of you who remember. Right? And then somebody put a, some, some university students at Georgetown University put up a web page that said, uh, you know, because uh, Georgetown has an Arabic program, a uh, bachelor's degree in Arabic, a master's and a PhD in Arabic. These were master's level students of the Arabic language. And they said, we've, uh, as, our, as our class project, we produced a surah like the Qur'an. And they put it up on GeoCities. It was an Uthmani script. Everything rhymed. It looked like the Mus'haf. And it, le- and it read like the Mus'haf. It, you know, and they said, look, we produced a surah like the Qur'an. And you know, then there have been other attempts. Uh, people have done this and said, okay, look, you know, I, I, the Qur'an issued a challenge. And here it is. My response to the challenge, here's a surah. And then they have several people come along, other professors, other, other colleagues, other students, who are their shuhada min dunillah, who say, yeah, yeah, it is like the Qur'an. So Allah said, produce something like the Qur'an and call your witnesses. So they said, okay, here's something like the Qur'an and we've got our witnesses. So done deal. You know? So that's, that's their idea. Now, the problem is the Qur'an did not reduce its challenge to one thing. Produce something in Arabic. Produce something that matches its style. Produce something that, you know, that uniquely matches it in context. The Qur'an is Im- unmatchable from so many different angles all at the same time that it actually becomes impossible for humanity to replace. So I'll give you just one or two examples of that before we come, come back to this idea of criticism. Why is it that they had to resort to criticism? You see, you have to take the time to study something and then find something that you can criticize and exhaust your energy actually studying the Qur'an so you can come up with criticisms. It's so much easier to just make something better. Right? So why go to this route? You only go to this because you can't come up with an alternative. So I'll just give you some points of view that are not commonly discussed. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam declared that he is a messenger. The, the revelation came to him at the age of what? 40. 40. And he delivered this mission 
for how long? How many years? 23 years. Okay, so this is a 20, the, the, the Quran is sent down over the course of 23 years in a no name peninsula in the world where there is no civilization, there's no infrastructure to speak of, no empire, no nothing. These are, these are like Bedouins that travel in tents and mud homes and they don't have much going on. And this is where the Quran came. Which means if it came here, it shouldn't have had the kind of global impact that it had. Entire continents should not have shifted because of these words that were uttered by a man without a microphone. You know, sometimes I, I wonder, like when Rasulullah was sitting there with the Sahaba in Mecca, and he's talking to them about the promises Allah has made. Like the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire shall fall, right? And the deen of Islam will spread everywhere. And these are young, 18, 19 year old Sahaba sitting there who get beat up if they pray at the Kaaba. So they're sitting on a bunch of rocks in the sun, burning, and Rasul is telling them, you know, right now you've been made homeless, you get beat up wherever they see you, and by the way, we're going to be taking over what? The Roman Empire, the Persian Empire. And these like 18 year olds are sitting there, yes, of course. What would you think of those kids? Like, these guys are so crazy. Look, look at the, what are they talking about? What are they talking about? Nobody would believe this, right? Now what I want you, to, want you to appreciate, not from an academic point of view, or rather not from a spiritual point of view, but purely from a historical, non-judgmental point of view. You look at these 23 years, and you have a people that have a tradition that's been going on for thousands of years. A religious tradition, a moral tradition, and by the way, cultures, they don't change overnight. If a culture has a certain treatment towards women for hundreds and hundreds of years, it's going to take a long time before that changes. And you have to usually, you know when that changes? It changes when there's a lot of foreign influence. So for example, now the world is modernizing. A lot of our grandparents had certain standards. We don't have those standards. The way men and women interacted with each other in Pakistan or India or Bangladesh or Sudan or Jordan or Egypt, the way men and women talk to each other 80 years ago is not the way they deal with each other today. The, the world has changed. But you know why that's changed? A, lot of, a big factor in that change is how much the outside world is able to influence these isolated places. Rasulullah is bringing about a change in this society. Is there any outside influence? Are there foreign invasions and new culture coming in and invading? No. It's just this man with an invisible delivery of the Qur'an, right? Now what happens in these 23 years? There are people that change not just the way they eat, but also the way they sleep, but also the way they wake up but also the way they clean themselves, but also the way they get married, but also, also the way they get divorced, the way they love, the way they hate, the way they raise their eyes, the way they lower their eyes, the way they lower their voices, the way they raise their voices, the, who their friends are, who their enemies, everything changed in 23 years. Culturally, socially, spiritually, economically, politically, there is not one facet of human life for these people who believed in the Prophet ﷺ, that it didn't change. And in 23 years, this society changes in every imaginable way. These, are, these people are nothing like they used to be. The only thing left of the old times is their language. And the pride of their language, for centuries upon centuries upon centuries. What was the pride of the Arabs? Their poetry. That was their pride. And now, for the next almost century, Nobody's recording poetry. Because the only thing being passed down is what? The Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, until actually later in the Sahaba generation, people are realizing we're going to lose Arabic. Because nobody cares about poetry anymore. Everybody's into Quran and Sunnah, but poetry has historical value. It gives us insight into the classical language. And Islam was spreading. There were non-Arabs coming into Islam. And when foreigners come into your, your, ter your region, your language gets weaker. Right? So Arabic was not as pure as it used to be, even within one generation, because so many people were coming into Islam. So an extra effort had to be made that scholars and the tabi'un, the tabi'a tabi'in, they would have to go and leave and go into the Arab villages where it's still there's no outside influence, and learn the ancient usage and old poetry of that time so they could document it. I mean, our scholars, when you learn that they went into the desert and spent 20 years there, why did they go there? Because the uncontaminated language was still there. This same language that used to be the pride of the Arabs is now nobody cares. You have to go to the most remote areas to find it now. This was the very center of their identity. This is what, this is what made them Arabs. Now, compare this to any other, I don't like the word revolution, but in a sense. Compare this to any revolution over the course of 23 years. 
there's a technological revolution, sure. There's a feminist revolution, sure. There can be a nation can have a political revolution. The Russians had a revolution in the last century, right? There have been the, the French had a revolution a couple of centuries ago. There's been an American revolution a few centuries ago. There are revolutions in history, but when the revolution is done, first of all, how much blood is spilled? Number one. Number two, after the blood is spilled, do people still eat the same food and love the same things and hate the, roughly pretty much? The, I mean, the economic system maybe changes or the political system maybe changes, but over, by and large, mostly the religious views stay the same, the political views may have changed, but the, cultural, the culture still stays the same. You know, the French diet is the same French diet before and after the revolution. There's not much difference. You know, the American psyche is the American psyche. Everything else about them is the same, you know. But when Islam comes, you don't ask what changed. You actually have to ask, what didn't change? What didn't change? Produce anything, even close to a document, words, that can bring about the kind of change in a society that the Qur'an brought in a matter of 23 years. When people even cite some of the greatest revolutions in history, and of course for the modern West, the French Revolution is pivotal because it's a shift from a religious, religiously controlled society to a secular society, right? And that's the, that's the era in which we still live today, a celebration of that original French or, or European revolution, that renaissance. Now, that revolution also, it came at the hands of certain authors, right? certain philosophical writers who couldn't come out and write openly, they had to write embedded in novel and story and you know, in other philosophical, more abstract literature, and most of these people were literaries and philosophers, right? These were not activists, these were not da'is of their cause, they weren't ready to die for what they believed, no, they just wrote novels, books, and the vast majority of them were long gone and dead before somebody picked up their ideas and were ready to create entire movements in their name. You understand? Like Marxists did not see Marx. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And Rasulullah receives revelation at the age of 40. And he calls for a change in society. And who's on the front lines fighting for that change in society? He himself. Never has been the intellectual who produces the ideas of change. If you want to call him a philosopher, we don't, we call him a prophet. He's given these ideas, he doesn't have these ideas of his own. He's given these ideas. But regardless, anyone carrying the ideas, these intellectuals were always where? In the back somewhere. Somewhere in the background. And young people were in the front. And here, here you have Rasulullah himself leading the charge. He's the intellectual head of this movement. He's the political, social, cultural, spiritual, in every sense the head of this movement of Islam. In these 23 years. That has never happened before in human history. Show me another, another time. I actually asked my history professor this. My history professor was a pretty cool guy, Italian fellow. I still remember him. And he was a political, political scientist. And I, he was a nerdy dude. Like he, like, I only like going to his class because I just like watching him behave. You know, he just acted weird. He had these big, thick glasses. He'd hunched over. He'd walk in. First day of class. You know why they call it the executive branch? You know, like... What kind of question? Because the president can execute people. <laughs> like, this is going to be an awesome class. I am not dropping out of this class. Calculus, goodbye. This, <laughs> I'm taking two semesters in a row. You know? <laughs> but you know, if, I asked him, I asked my political, like, can you, sh can you document any, you know, any time in history where over the course of less than three decades, actually short of 25 years, that a change of a magnitude across all human spheres, personal and public. You know, revolutions, sometimes they're, they're, they're public, and sometimes they're what? Personal. Like, mobile, it, the mobile devices changed personal interaction of human beings. It's a personal revolution, right? But a change in economic policy could be a public thing. The Qur'an and this religion changed people dramatically how? Publicly and privately. Like in their most private of lives. And the way a person even goes to relieve themselves. Which foot should they put into the bathroom first? <laughs> you just think about that. Which hand should you eat with first? What should, you say, what should you say when you're getting married? What do you do when you get on a ride? What prayers do you make? Like there's not a, an aspect of human activity that wasn't touched by Islam. And revolutionized by Islam really completely turned around. 
So in that sense, when the Quran says produce a surah, you can make a surah at Georgetown University. Congratulations to you. You can make a challenge to the Quran and put it on Amazon.com. That's fine. But what impact has it had on humanity? What footprint has it left behind? The Quran is one document. It's not even a big document. It's not even a fifth of the Bible size. And the amount of books that the Quran gave birth to in the world, I shouldn't even say books, the amount of libraries the Quran gave birth to, entire volumes of literature on law, philosophy, theology, history, that are filling shelves around the world, are all in the end the byproduct of one document, the Quran. Subhanallah. Show me another document, please. As time went on, somebody came along and said, well, if, because you know, the argument made by some scholars was this challenge was issued to the Arabs of the time. They were not able to meet this challenge. The battle is over. Some came along and said, no, why do you say the battle's over? The challenge should still stand. We should still be able to challenge the Quran. You guys say it's a living book, so it should be a living challenge. And I say, fine. If you want it to be a living challenge, then meet, meet its living standards. The Quran today, I even I ta was talking to somebody you know, a, a while ago about this challenge. I told him, look, I mean, let's not talk about anything else. Let's just talk about Euless, Texas. No town, no, not, not, let's not even go all of Euless. Let's keep in South Euless. Okay, just this part, little, little corner. And let's say electricity is gone. Let's say internet is gone. Let's say mobile devices, telephone communication, all communication is gone. And all printed books disappear from Euless. From this town in the middle of Texas, North Texas, all printed books disappear. There is no Bible, there is no United States Constitution, there is no Tarrant County bylaws, nothing. All of it's gone. Which document is recovered overnight? Quran, no problem. No problem. In this town. How long before the Bible's recovered in Euless, Texas? How long before the Old Testament or the New Testament or the Psalms of David or how long before Plato's Republic is recovered? How long if you think about that? How long before the United States Constitution is recovered? Let's not go thousands of years, let's go a few hundred. How about this te the Texas Constitution? How about that? <laughs> Subhanallah. And let's do this experiment in Plano. Let's do it in Irving. Let's do this experiment in Cincinnati, Ohio. <laughs> Let's do this in like, you know, Nassau County in Long Island, not even the entire Long Island. Over and over again around the world, the Quran lives in the hearts of people. Please show me another document. Please show me another document that lives in the heart of that many human beings in such a living way that it can be recovered overnight. Please show me. Bring something even close to this. I mean, from a literary point of view, from a linguistics point of view, a historical point of view, an impact point of view, a memorization point of view. The points of view are too many. There are too many. Dr. Fadl Saleh Hassan al Rai said it so beautifully in his book, At Ta'bir al Qurani. He said, when he talked about the language of the Quran and how miraculous it is, he said, it is not the miracle of the Quran. Now, let me get, he gave an analogy, and I want to share that analogy with you. A diver goes into the ocean, reaches the bottom, finds a pearl comes back out, holds the pearl and says, this is beautiful, this is what makes the ocean amazing. Another guy dives in, comes out with three more pearls and they're all bigger. And he says, no, 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 excuse me, this is what makes the ocean amazing. They're both wrong. What makes the ocean amazing is far more than what you can discover, isn't it? There's far more endless treasure and far more endless discovery inside of the ocean than what is possible for even all of humanity to find out. It's too deep and too much to discover. You understand? Allah Azza wa says about just the words of Allah, He compares them to the ocean. That if the oceans were turned into ink to appreciate for the purpose of the words of my Master, if you were to just try to appreciate the words of Allah with ink that was the worth of oceans, you wouldn't be able to find enough ink. And the, the words of Allah would still remain unappreciated. <laughs> you, you wouldn't be able to encompass it. That's the challenge of Quran. So it wasn't met and it will not be met. That is our iman. 
On the other hand, criticism against the Qur'an will always be there. The challenge is one thing, it's impossible to meet. Well, if that's impossible, well at least now you're upset. <laughs> so when you're upset, of course, you're going to find something to complain about. Something to pick at. Oh, there are so many contradictions in the Qur'an. It doesn't even make sense. It says this, and it says that, and there's going to be all this kind of talk. Right? And Allah Azza wa Jal preempts it in the surah. He says, Inna Allah la yastahi. No doubt about it, it is in fact Allah. He is not ashamed. An yadriba mathalan. Ma. To give an example. Arabic students know that the word mathal is nakira, mathalan. When you add ma, it actually makes it even more. This is ma al ibhamiya. This is actually making it even more ambiguous. Any kind of example whatsoever. Whatsoever, in Arabic expression, back in the day and even today, if somebody says, man, I'm hungry, give me some food. What do you want to eat? Shay'an ma. Just give me something, man. Anything, I don't care. It's all, doesn't matter, just let me eat. This is ma. In other words, Allah says, Allah has no embarrassment. He has no hesitation in dropping whatever example, in striking an example of any kind whatsoever. This is actually an educational principle in the Book of Allah. And from it, we learn educational philosophy. In order to get the point across, you have to get out of your comfort zone, and you can't be formal. When you think about the benefit of the student, you have to talk to the student at a level that the student will understand. You shouldn't just talk in high language with big words, and you know, to, make, to impress somebody of how much you know and how much exhaustive vocabulary you have, and how many books you can quote, that's not teaching. You're just trying to impress someone with how much you know. Teaching is when you talk to people in a way they can actually learn. Allah Azza wa Jal, let me guarantee you, has better vocabulary than all of us. He has a more sophisticated knowledge of science than any scientist. He, have more, he has more sophisticated, deeper understanding of the nuances of the unseen, and the seen, and iman, than any of us. But Allah chooses subhanahu wa ta'ala to talk in language وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنِ لِلذِّكْرِ He made the Qur'an easy. You know sometimes you read a book on aqidah. Or you get into, for example, you know, the ayat are coming later فَسَوَّاهُ النَّا سَبْعَ سَمَوَاتِ ثُمَّ اسْتَوَاعَ لِلْعَرْشِ ثُمَّ اسْتَوَاعَ لِلْعَرْشِ You study tafsir of this ayah. You read the, you know, the Mu'tazilis and the Maturidis and you read Imam Razi and you read Ruh Al-Ma'ani, Al-Alusi and you're reading pages and pages and pages of what does it mean and it's so abstract you want to pull your hair out and Allah when He speaks He's so straightforward, simple, no complications. Study a, study a philosophy text. College students have taken philosophy classes before. How much fun is it to read a philosophy essay? <laughs> You just bang your head on it. What is he saying? You know, going around in abstract circles. But Quran, Allah Azza wa Jal could have made it. You know, because you know what they do, by the way. PhD papers, academics, scholars, they actually purposely make their papers more difficult, because that's their way of showing off how academic they are, how sophisticated they are. You know, using big vocabulary even when they don't need to. You know. And this, this notion is actually something shattered in the Qur'an. Allah is not ashamed to give any example. He doesn't shy away from dropping any example. And I actually internalized that lesson a long time ago. Like when you're teaching, think about what example to give that will help the person understand. That's the only thing in front of you as a teacher. What will help the student understand? One of my, one of my, my, my favorite mentors in my career as a teacher was actually a non-Muslim woman. I was, I was taking, I used to be a chaplain at a university and the, the perks were that you can take any class you want for free. So, and you can walk in and out of any class for free. So I took a master's degree course in preschool education. So cool. This lady was a PhD in early childhood education. All the people in the class are preschool teachers certified. I'm the only one who's not a preschool teacher. First day in class she walks in, she walked in with a book. A book about a lion and a mouse with like font size 36. She walk, in a master's degree class at a $25,000 a year university, she walks in with this book. She opens it and she goes, old woman too, like 55 years old. Once upon a time, there was a lion. <laughs> and we're all like, huh? where is he? <laughs> <You know? laughs> she was teaching us that when you're, when you're teaching, you can't be shy. 
You have to animate yourself. You have to express yourself. You have to do whatever it takes to teach. To, get, to make students lose the world they were in and take them into a different world. And I just sat there going, wow, there was a lion. You know? <laughs> That's actually something, it's a sunnah of Allah. لا يستحي أن يضرب مثلا ما Any example at all, he will give. He is not shy to do so. Whatever will benefit you. بعوضتن بعوضة is translated as mosquito. That's actually a common mistake. بق is mosquito. بعوضة comes from the Arabic word بعض. بعض means some. بعوضة is actually some small fraction of a mosquito. And it's also called a baby mosquito, like a little bit of a mosquito. It's an itty bitty little, tiny, tiny little barely visible thing. This was the smallest insect visible to the Arab eye. It was called a ba'uda. The smallest kind of creature visible to the eye, that was called ba'uda. If Allah wants, He can give an example of ba'uda. If He'll get, your, if, get the point across, that's what He'll do. فَمَا فَوْقَهَا this is a little bit of a tough language that if, if we don't appreciate the, the nuance in it, it literally says, and whatever may be above it. The, the tiniest of insects, the bit of an insect, or whatever's above it. Meaning, it has two meanings. One, whatever's even bigger than it in size. So what does the Qur'an do? It uses dhubab. In yaslubhumu dhubabu shay'an, it uses the fly. The fly is bigger than the ba'uda, yeah? Then it uses, inna buyuti labaytul an kabut. It uses the spider. And then it goes bigger and bigger and bigger. Tuyur. Birds are mentioned. But then, fawqaha in a qualitative sense actually means Allah is not ashamed to give the example of the smallest possible thing you can see and something even more far fetched. Meaning physically bigger or actually even more unimaginable. How could you possibly use that as an example? And by using ba'uda, by the way, which is commonly known in Arabic literature, it's the smallest thing visible to the Arab eye. That moves is ba'uda. Allah Azza wa Jalla is saying that when you do give an example, then you should give an example that at least people can visualize. By saying so, the principle that's coming from here is that when examples are given, a picture should be drawn. Actually, we already saw this. When Allah Azza wa Jalla gave the example, did He paint a picture? So the more visual your example can be, the more actively you can engage the, the imagination of your audience, the closer you are to the sunnah of Allah in teaching. So, مَثَلًا مَا بَعُولَةً فَمَا فَوْقَهَا But when you give any kind of example, فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا فَيَعْلَمُونَ أَنَّهُ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ As for those who've believed, and who are looking to believe, آمَنَا The fi'l can also be, come sometimes in طَلَبُ fi'l, Meaning those who've believed, and those who are looking to believe. People who come to the Qur'an looking for truth. Those kinds of people, what will be their response? فَيَعْلَمُونَ أَنَّهُ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ Then they know for sure themselves, that it is in fact truth from their master. Now, truth is a limited translation of haqq. And in this ayah, you have to appreciate the full scope of the meaning of truth. So we'll understand it in a little more nuanced way. The first meaning of haqq is in fact truth. Al-haqq also means purpose. Purpose. خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ بِالْحَقْ He created the skies and the earth with purpose. It doesn't just mean with truth, it means purposefully. There's a reason for which it was created. Now, haqq also means rightful. Somebody's right is also there, haqq. Annahu al-haqq min rabbihim actually means Allah has the right to give this example and it's worthy of giving. Haqq also means worthiness. This is the right example to give at this time. This example has real purpose, it's not without purpose. This example is in fact, the, you know, uh, true is actually the least of the meanings here. It's purposefulness and rightfulness and appropriateness. That's actually what's implied here. Believers know it's got to have a reason. In other words, the believer will never study any part of the Qur'an, the part they understand and the part they don't understand. They will always have the same attitude. There is a reason for which Allah said this. I don't, op I don't know this yet. Allah hasn't opened the doors of wisdom yet for me. I don't get it yet. Maybe I will, but I know it has a purpose. Nothing Allah ever says is without purpose. This is the attitude in our reading of the Qur'an. When you read any other book, you might skip a passage you don't get. Eh, I don't want to think about this, let's just move on. Oh, this is repeating, I already got this, you move on. You skip. When somebody sends you a long email, you scroll to the bottom. And this is Jazakallah khairan, as alaykum. <laughs> you know, when you study Qur'an, you stop at everything. Things you understand and things you don't understand. And you leave questions there. Ya Allah, one day open, open the doors of wisdom. Open my heart so, you, so I see what you're saying here. So I can truly appreciate what you're saying. 
This is the attitude of a believer. مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ By the way, from their master. In other words, they remain humble in the reading of the book. You know, when you're reading a book or you're listening, you could have said مِنْ مُعَلِّمِهِمْ From their teacher. مِنْ Allah From Allah. قَالْ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ From their master. In other words, our study of the Qur'an must be a study of a slave, not a student. How does a slave learn instructions and how does a student learn instructions? A slave learns because he's only learning to make the master happy. A slave learns with humility. A slave comes to the book without pride. A student can come with an attitude. Eh, you know, I can just drop this class, take another class. I don't have to get everything. I guess if I get bare minimum, I'll pass. I'm okay. But a slave is concerned, humbled before Allah. And that attitude is, it needs to permeate in the, you know, in the study of the Qur'an. وَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا and as for those who have disbelieved, and I believe in the context, the dominant meaning here of kafaru is actually been kufran and ni'mah. The people who are ungrateful, those who have been ungrateful, in other words, they don't appreciate the fact that Allah went out of His way to give an example. You know, I was studying this and I, I was just dumbfound. One of the most beautiful examples in the Qur'an is Surah An-Nur. Allahu nuru samawati wa dal. One of the most beautiful examples in the Qur'an. And at the end of all that, that entire picture, Allah says, وَيَضْرِبُ اللَّهُ الْأَمْثَالَ لِلنَّاسِ Allah gives examples for the benefit of people. And then He adds something even more profound. He says, وَاللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٌ Allah already knows everything. Allah doesn't need the examples. You do. Allah didn't have to come to your level and to give you an example that you can understand, that's why Allah says in the Quran, "Inna ja'alnahu Qur'anan Arabian, Inna anzalnahu Qur'anan Arabian, la'allakum ta'qilun." We made this into an Arabic Quran. We sent it down as an Arabic Quran so you can understand. He made this book understandable to you. So when Allah goes out of His way to get, to, to reveal the best lesson, most suited for your benefit, and you are not even grateful for that, you you learn you read the same lesson and you complain. Then who's more ungrateful than you? And that's why أَمَّا الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا Those who are ungrateful, what's their re reaction to this amazing courtesy given by Allah of giving an example? فَيَقُولُونَ Then they turn around and say, مَاذَا أَرَادَ Allah? What does Allah intend? بِهَذَا مَثَلًا By giving this as an example. Arabic students, beware. Common mistake in translation here. مَاذَا أَرَادَ Allah بِهَذَا مَثَلًا Translated, what does Allah mean by this example? Homie, this does not say this example. That would have been هذا المثل. That would have been اسم الإشارة and مشارة and or بدل. This is تمييز. هذا مثلا. It's different. And it makes the world of a difference. Oh my God. Everything changes. A student can actually come to the teacher and say, Teacher, what does this example mean? That's a legitimate question. That's a completely fair question. And believers can ask actually, ماذا أراد الله بهذا المثل? No problem. But when you become condescending and you talk down to your teacher and you say, what's the point of this as an example? You're going to give this as an example? That's the tamiz. <laughs> That's an attitude problem. Questions are not the problem in our religion. It's the attitude with which you ask them. It's the tone with which you ask them. The Qur'an is very specific, not just about our speech, but the nature of our speech. You can't just say assalamu alaikum. You have to be smiling too. You can't say assalamu alaikum. That's not salam. You can't somebody says kayfa haluku, you're like oh, alhamdulillah. Like that's not alhamdulillah. You can't do that. You know? You can't say salam, which means I'm at peace with you, there's no fight between us, we're all good. And then slam the door and say assalamu alaikum. Like that's not salam. You know? Attitude and speech go hand in hand. So when somebody comes and asks, I don't understand, there's a tone. And the negative tone is captured in the tamiz here. ماذا أراد الله بهذا مثلا? With this as an example, what does Allah intend? What's the point of this? What's even the point? يُضِلُّ بِهِ كَثِيرًا He misguides by means of it, many. The, the ha could go to many things. Allah could be, it, he could mean here that يُرِدُ بِالْقَوْلِ Meaning by this kind of speech, he misguides many. But the dominant view is this example in this Qur'an. Allah will misguide many by, the mean, by means of the same Qur'an. Lots of people, instead of finding guidance in the Qur'an, يَزِيدُهُمْ nufura, 
it will increase them even more hatred. They'll hate it even more. The more they read Quran, the more they'll hate it. Why? They came with the wrong attitude. وَيَهْدِي بِهِ كَثِيرًا And he'll guide many, many, many with it by means of the same Qur'an. Same Qur'an is guidance, same Qur'an can be misguidance, depends on the lens you put on. Depends on the eyes with which you look. Subhanallah. Now we're understanding what it meant when Allah said, هُدَى muttaqin. You have to come with the right attitude and it will be guidance. Otherwise, no. But if you just read this much, he misguides many by it, he guides many by it, a question is created. Which one am I? If Allah, if Allah decides that I will be misguided by the Qur'an, what's the fault of mine? Allah Himself clarifies, who are the people who don't deserve guidance from this book? Who does He misguide, even by the Qur'an? The ultimate guidance. The, its name is the guide, and yet people are getting misguided by it. Who could those unfortunate people be? Allah Himself says, وَمَا يُضِلُّ بِهِ إِلَّا الْفَاسِقِينَ And no, He doesn't misguide by means of it anyone at all. يعني وَمَا يُضِلُّ بِهِ أَحَدًا This is the, the mustafna is not mentioned here. This is why al istithna al-mufarraq is open-ended. There is not a soul, not a human being, no creature will ever, ever, ever be misguided by means of this Qur'an except al-fasiqeen. Except those whose corruption comes out. Fasaqa in Arabic actually used, it's actually used for fruits that go bad and the peel like an orange or a banana that's gotten very old and parts of the peel has melted away and the inside is gooing out. That's actually fasaqa. Fasaqa al muz you know, fasaqa tufaha, fasaqa tufaha. The apple gets bad. When the inside comes out, al khuruju, aslul fisq al khuruj, to come out. Allah says, Allah does not misguide by means of it, except those whose corruption has gotten so bad inside of them that it even starts what? Coming out. It just starts, it even comes out. Those are the people that Allah will not let guidance happen to. Because their filth was so overwhelming, it couldn't even be contained. And then, if that definition wasn't comprehensive enough, the next ayah actually describes who al-fasiqeen are. Now on this point, because we have to compare the Qur'an and the language of the Qur'an and the language of the Muslims, it's important to make a distinction. In the language of the fuqaha, the Muslims, fasiq can be a sinner. A sinner can be fasiq. Like somebody who's regularly missing prayer can be called, according to the fuqaha, fasiq. Okay? Somebody who's not kind to his mother can also be called fasiq. Somebody who's not, you know, like he's delayed giving mahar or something to his wife, or he's done some sin or the other. Okay? These kind of people can be called what? Fasiq. This is in the language of the fuqaha and the culture of the Muslims. But please understand, just because we use that word for each other, and then you read that word in the Qur'an, you're like, oh my God, my cousin. <laughs> right? He, he'll never get guidance from the Qur'an. Because he's totally fasiq. And, no, 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 no. This is high level fasiq situation here. There's degrees of fisq. There's degrees of corruption. The Qur'an talks about the ultimate high-end fasiq. You understand? It's not just anybody who just you know, falls under some category of fisq according to the fuqaha. Now, according to the jurists. Now, let's see what Allah defines the fasiq as. It's amazing. الَّذِينَ يَنْقُضُونَ عَهْدَ اللَّهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مِثَاقِهِ Those who violate the promise made with Allah. The promise made binding by Allah. And naqada. Violate, I'm translating it, actually means halul uqda. It actually means to undo a knot. A knot takes a lot of work to tie. Ask a, th ask a third grader. It's a lot of work to tie a knot. But it's very little to what? Undo it. A knot is actually very strong. It can serve a purpose. But it's very easy to undo. And when you undo it, it can create disturbance, destruction. Ibram, for example, back in the old days, Construction in Arabic was not with cement. Construction was in the Arab culture, you would take two beams of wood and you would tie them. Coil it this way, coil it that way, coil it this way, coil it that way, tie it up. That was called al-ibram. Okay? The idea of tying something tight. And you can naqdul al-ibram, which means you just undid the rope and it just all came apart. Okay? That's the idea of yanqudun. So the image that's projected by this word is the idea of you being tied into something. You being tied into something. So Allah says, الَّذِينَ يَنْقُضُونَ عَهْدَ اللَّهِ 
those who untie, in a sense, the promise made with Allah. In other words, the promise you've made is with, with, with Allah has tied you to Him, has connected you to Him. Now, what is used to tie someone to something? What is used to tie? Tell me. A rope. A rope. And in the Qur'an's own language, what is the Qur'an itself called? وَاعْتَصِمُوا bi حَبْلِ اللَّهِ فَبِالْحَبْلِ يُثَقَ with the, with the rope, he's tied. The rope itself is the Qur'an. And we are tied to Allah in the promise through what? The word of Allah. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ would say, وَهُوَ حَبْلُ اللَّهِ الْمَتِينَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ إِلَى الْأَرْضِ The Qur'an is the extended rope of Allah, extending from the skies all the way to the earth. We are holding one end of it, and the other end is with Allah. It directly connects us to Allah. It ties us to Allah. Those who untie the promise made with Allah, one of its first meanings is those who undo their relationship with Allah's own words. Those who let go of Allah's words. Those who, go, who let go of the promise made with Allah. But there's a deeper meaning here, which I'll get to inshallah in the next ayah. Hopefully I can get to all of it today and be concise. مِن بَعْدِ مِثَاقِهِ Even after it has been deep, uh, uh, strongly tightened up. Al withaq in Arabic to tie something up and tighten it. This is withaq. Wathaq or wathiq in Arabic is used for confidence. Confidence meaning I'm absolutely sure about something, I've tightened it up tight. Allah says that they undo the promise of Allah even after it was tightened tight. In other words, it wasn't a loose tie that they just kind of pulled the string and it came apart. It took effort even to untie it. It was a strong thing that they undid. They went out of their way. Because you know the corruption wasn't little, it was so bad that it came out even, right? In ba'di mithaqi. Now, on this end you have to understand, so far what I've shared with you, is these people have cut their relationship with who? With Allah. They cut the rope, they untied the rope. They disconnected themselves with Allah. Now if you look at the next part of this ayah, وَيَقْطَعُونَ مَا أَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ أَنْ يُصَلْ And they cut up, first they untie, then they... Cut. Notice everything here is about disconnecting. All the language is about disconnecting. They cut what Allah commanded to keep joined together. They cut what Allah commanded and yusala that should be joined together. Yusala comes from the word sila, which is connection. And pretty much majority of the mufassirun agree, and it's very clear from the siyaq also. Allah created the human being with two relationships: one with Him and one with other human beings, starting with our own mother. You would not be on this earth if you did not have a relationship with another human being, starting with your own mother. And then the relationship with Allah is injected into you, the ruh that came from Allah Azza wa They've cut their relationship with Allah. As a result, they also start cutting their relationship with their family, their friends, their community. These are the kinds of people who don't give their parents their rights, their children their rights, their spouses their rights, their brothers their rights, their neighbors their rights, fellow human beings their rights. Things that were meant, human beings were meant to live together. They were meant to live and coexist in harmony. These are the people who cut those ties that Allah commanded have to be kept together. Especially, you know, ulul arham, ba'duhum awla bi ba'dhin fi kitabillah. The relationships that tie us together through the, 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 the belly of a mother, those relationships take priority in our religion. Actually, all humanity in a sense is connected by a mother. All humanity is the byproduct of Adam and Hawa, salamun alayhima. So we're all connected by motherhood, actually, and fatherhood. But even, even in your own situation, like there are some relationships, there's actually of the relationships, there's one that's by choice. Marriage is by choice, right? Pretty much every family relationship you have outside of that is not your choice. You didn't choose your mom, you didn't choose your kids, you didn't choose your siblings. Those are not choices. That choice was made by who? It was made by Allah. And Allah commanded that you be connected to these people. Because that wasn't your choice, that was His. Those are the relationships they can't possibly cut. They couldn't possibly sever those relationships, even no matter how much they tried. No matter how much a Pakistani mother gets angry at her son, she can't say, Aaj ke baad mere bete nahi ho. You're not my son from after today. I don't want to, you're no longer my son. You are as good as dead to me. Mother, you can say whatever you want. He's still your son, and he's still alive. Yes. <laughs> He's not dead, he's right there. You know, you can't just call off a relationship. Ah, I'm done with you. You're no longer my sibling. <laughs> he is. She is. You know, you, things can get as bad as you want, but the corrupt first, 
they were able to sever their tie with Allah. And then they severed their ties with their fellow kin. So the two things that bring goodness in humanity is our relationship with Allah and as a result, our relationship with the rest of humanity. You know, and they cut both of them. And these are the most corrupt of people. You will see them not just violent and vicious against Allah, you'll see them vicious against who? People around them. These are al-fasiqeen. These are the people Allah does not give guidance to from His book. This is the definition of al-fasiqeen. How profound, you know? وَمَا يُضِلُّ بِهِ إِلَّا الْفَاسِقِينَ الَّذِينَ يَنْقُضُونَ عَهْدَ اللَّهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مِثَاقِهِ وَيَقْطَعُونَ مَا أَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ أَنْ يُصَلْ And as a result, when you've cut yourself from God, and you've cut yourself from people, you don't owe anything to people, you just want to be your own thing, then what's the only thing left? وَيُفْسِدُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ And, they, and they, therefore they cause great deals of corruption in the land. Tell me something. We have in traditional societies across the world, family systems. People used to take care of their parents in old age. People used to take care of their siblings. People used to be able to walk into each other's homes, neighbors. We used to, as a neighborhood, take care of our children together. Are we living in that same world today? No, those are stories of ancient times. Your kid is in the front porch and you're constantly keeping an eye because somebody just walk, your neighbor just walked around and you're like, I don't know what his intentions are. We are that paranoid and we're that individualized now. And then you have parents uh, you know, uh, people whose parents are getting older and those parents are living far, far away and even when they call, it's annoying. Even when they call, you're like, I have to go, I'm busy. Don't have time for this. You know? Young people can't wait to leave home. They can't wait to get out of the house under the annoying shadow of their father and their mother and they want to go off to college or wherever else and when they go, the first people they send a voicemail are their parents or their siblings. But when a friend calls, especially an illegitimate kind of friend, then immediate response. You know, this is, if that's not cutting off, when you cut the people you're supposed to be connected to, Allah first of all, and the people you're supposed to be connected to, the only thing that can come out of you is facade. You're not just going to be corrupt, you're going to cause corruption. وَيُفْسِدُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ They'll cause corruption in the land. Some of the most, like, and now when the corruption goes so far and so out there, then you're going to have philosophies like, well, you know, marriage is a pretty artificial construct. Who needs it? You know, the kinds of immorality that is now considered not just normal, but the way humanity should move forward is a result of these cuts. When family ties and the tie with Allah was cut, then what else do you expect? وَيُفْسِدُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ And so, and these people think that they're winning. They think that keeping those ties together are somehow, you know, it's like a chain. I want to be free. I want to be able to do whatever I want. I want to have whatever relationship I want with as many people as I want, whenever I want. I want to eat whatever I want, drink whatever I want, consume whatever I want. I want to make money however I want, spend it however I want. I don't want to be tied by anything. I don't want to be tied by expectations to a family or to God or to anything else. When you are open and free like that, you think that you have saved yourself from loss. Like you're not missing out on life. And the, the language of Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, Ula'ika humul khasirun. Those people, they're the ultimate losers. They think they're winning. They think they just freed themselves and the world just opened up to them. They're the ultimate losers. Subhanallah. In one ayah, the definition of fisk, so comprehensive, I can't think of another in the Quran of this comprehensive nature. And why, wouldn't, why would Allah give them the ultimate gift of guidance? When they can question the examples given by Allah, a guide, the most beautiful of guidance is handed to them, but they, they don't want anything to do with this relationship. Now we get to this next ayah, I think 12 minutes is enough to get to this ayah inshaAllah ta'ala. Very profound philosophical ayah, lots of things have been said about it. I shall share with you what I find the most convincing of the opinions that I found. I'm grateful to the late Dr. Isar Ahmed rahimahullah, who had profound insight into this ayah. Actually he had that insight in his 20s and he wrote, a, uh, 20s and 30s, and he wrote a paper on this ayah when he was, uh, in 1985, 86, he wrote a paper on this ayah. And it was published, and several ulama from around Pakistan and India read it and appreciated his work on this ayah. So I'm going to give you a summary of what he had said, because I do think it's, it's of, of great value. Allah Azza wa Jal says, كَيْفَ تَكْفُرُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَكُنْتُمْ مَمْوَاتًا How could you, how could you possibly be ungrateful to Allah and disbelieve in Allah while you used to be dead? You used to be dead. Stage one, you used to be dead. فَأَحْيَاكُمْ Then he brought you to life. Stage 
Two. Thumma yumitukum. Then he will give you death. Stage what? Three. Thumma yuhyikum. Then he will bring you back to life. Stage? Four. What was the first stage? You used to be dead. The first thing we have to distinguish is being dead and non-existence are not the same thing. Being dead and not existing is not the same thing. As a matter of fact, if somebody, somebody's janazah, they're in the coffin, dead, that doesn't mean they don't exist. As a matter of fact, in any language, the use of the word dead only applies when they used to have what before then? Life. So in the ayah, there seems to be an indication, Allah says, how could you dis- disbelieve in Allah while you used to be dead? And by the way, in the Qur'an and in the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, death is very close to sleep. Death and sleep are deeply connected and related to each other. As a matter of fact, Bismikallahumma amutu wa ahya as you go to sleep. Alhamdulillahi ladhi ahyana ba'dama amatana wa ilayhi nushud Not ba'dama anamana, but ba'dama amatana. Alhamdulillah, the one who gave us life after he had given us death. So death and sleep are very, very close to each other. You with me so far? But then, strangely, the ayah doesn't begin, how could you disbelieve in Allah and you were nothing and Allah created you? That's not what he said. He said, you used to be dead. That's a very specific phrase. And then what makes it even more pertinent is Surah Al-Mu'min. Allah Azza wa says about, this is on the tongue of disbelievers on Judgment Day. And they're, re- they're regressing and they're you know, disgusted by their behavior. Now they're so disgusted with themselves, they turn to Allah and they make an appeal to Allah to be given another chance. But the rationale they use is pretty epic. Listen to this. Rabba, qalu Rabbana. أَمَتَّنَا اثْنَتَيْنِ وَأَحْيَيْتَنَا اثْنَتَيْنِ فَاعْتَرَفْنَا بِذُنُوبِنَا فَهَلْ إِلَىٰ خُرُوجٍ مِّنْ سَبِيلٍ Ya Allah, you had given us death twice. You gave us life twice. And we admit we were wrong. We admit our sins. Could you, I mean you've done it twice before. Could you just another time, please? <laughs> I mean you did, you did do it twice. <laughs> The, the piece that I want your attention on here is The first thing they said was What did Allah give them twice? To give death Can only happen when you have what? Life You can't be given death Unless you have life to begin with So the ayah at hand that reads How can you disbelieve in Allah And you used to be dead Suggests that there was actually, actually a life Even before this one So that's actually not stage one This is stage Two, stage one is a life that already existed, then came the sleep, I'm putting sleep now instead of what? Death, because death and sleep are close to each other, actually on judgment day when we come out of our graves, some people will say, مَنْ بَعَثَنَا مِنْ مَرْقَدِنَا Who brought us out of our beds? Who brought us out of our beds, our sleeping places? مَرْقَدِنَا Anyway, the first stage was a life. Then Allah gave us this sleep, this death. Then there's a life, then there's that. Let's understand what this journey means. This is the journey of life itself. Okay? The first thing Allah Azza wa Jal did is He created all of us, all of us at the same time. All of us were created, this creation called the Ruh was created all at the same time. And when we were all together before Allah, there is the Ruh doesn't have age, it doesn't have gender, it doesn't have any of that stuff. It's beyond those things. But it was actually me and it was actually you. It was Nu'man, it was Wasif, it was Abdullah, you know, it was Husna, it was Wali. All of us existed. And we weren't children or adults or you know, ancients and new ones. We were all arwah, alam al-arwah. And we were in the company of Allah, alive and well. And it, we didn't have a body yet. There was no body yet. There was just the ruh. And the ruh is a creature made of light. And we used to talk to Allah directly. Allah doesn't tell us a lot about those conversations. But He did give us a little tiny little picture of one of those conversations. One day Allah turns to all those human beings that He has created. And He says to them in Surah Al-A'raf, Alastu bi rabbikum? Am I not the master of all of you? And we all said, Bala, of course you are. Shahidna. We testify, you are. You are. Allah said that because Allah mentions in the same ayah, I made you testify like this so that you don't become unaware of this one day. That light, that ruh, was in the company of who? Allah. And it receives its light from who? Allah Azza wa Jal. وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ That ruh that Allah Azza wa Jal created, that was there, fine. Then Allah put us in a coma state, it seems. We all went to sleep, a kind of death. That is the death being mentioned here. Then, 
our father impregnates our mother and our mother is carrying a baby in her womb and that baby gets old enough and Allah commands one of those sleeping souls one of those arwah he commands the angel take this one and put it inside that baby and that same ruh travels and it comes inside this baby and now you're here and now you're going to be coming out of your mother and Allah has given you what? life that's, that's now your second life your first life was with the company of Allah this is your second life and the one that you're going to meet Allah and of course from here it's obvious then you're going to die again you're going to be in the grave again and when you're in the grave your soul shall travel your ruh shall travel it will speak it will be questioned and put back in the grave and then you'll be brought out again and that will be your next and final life you with me now? Turja'un. then you will be taken back before Allah now this journey is important to know because I won't go deeper yet because you know I don't want to I want to rush through it but I do want to share one or two things with you what, whose company was the human being in before anybody else's company? The company of Allah. And the company so close that not only did Allah speak to us directly, we spoke to Allah directly. You know, when you're in good company, you get influenced. It's natural, right? You can't imagine that you're in the company of Allah and you're not influenced. That can't be. Allah Azza wa Jal impacted every single soul. And that's why Allah says, Fitrat Allah allati fatara nasa alayha. The beautiful nature of Allah, the molding of Allah that He molded human beings on. We were in His company, we got molded. Our personalities got molded. By the way, human beings have a glimpse of every attribute of Allah in some way or the other. Allah is Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim. Do we show mercy? Allah is Al Hakim. Do we have some wisdom? Allah is a Sami'. Do we like to listen? Allah Azza wa Jalla is Al-Khaliq, He creates everything. Do human beings have a desire to create stuff? Even from childhood, put Legos together. Do we have the desire to create stuff? Every attribute of Allah Azza wa Jalla, in some little glimpse of it, you find it where? Inside? Adam, inside the human being. And that's when you understand the phrase of the Prophet ﷺ in several hadith, which is actually mimicking the Bible, but when you study the biblical version, you find it shirki. It's actually a very profound statement. In Allah khalaqa Adam ala suratihi. Allah Azza wa Jalla created Adam in his image, not physical image, in the image of those names and attributes that make Allah Azza wa Jalla beautiful, he made a reflection of them in the human being. Now that human being who was in the company of Allah was put inside a mother, and then he comes out, and he starts growing up, and as he grows up inside this body, he gets preoccupied with this body, but he doesn't lose sight of the fact that there's something deeper inside him. He was in a company, and when you're in the company of Allah, you're certainly going to miss him. Something's going to be missing in your life. And so as the human being grows, no matter what culture they belong to, all human beings have had a desire for better home. They've had a desire for beauty. They've had a desire for better clothing, perfection. You, why, do, why do you think you have this urge to move the furniture every few weeks? No, this looks better here. This color goes better there. I want to try this. I want to try that. We're constantly looking for more and more beautiful, aren't we? Do birds do that? Do alligators do that? More and more beautiful? Do monkeys do that? You know, evolution can't even explain the human, human propensity for art. They can, it, it can't. That's never existed. Because it's not a necessity for survival. Why do you need art for survival? Why do you need poetry for survival? Why do you need language beyond basic communication? Ah, uh, ah, ah. We didn't need more than that. You know? Mothers know the way they talk to their kids. Uh, that's, that's enough. That's, it. that's all you need for like 16 years. It's just <laughs> the fact that we have beautiful words, we can think in the abstract, we can talk about art, beauty. You know, these things that are inside of us. Why? Because. We're constantly seeking perfection, isn't it? In life, that desire to seek perfection, even in the material sense, is actually rooted in the soul that was in the company of perfection. We were in the company of Allah, who is in Allah, Jamilun yuhibbu al Jamal. Fal insan yuhibbu al Jamal. Human beings just look for perfection. And by the way, they think they want to move to a nicer house. They want to get nicer clothes. They want to get a nicer car. They want to look nicer. They want to smell nicer. They want nicer, 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 nicer. But does it ever satisfy? No. Because 
nothing will fill the, perf the void of perfection like the company of Allah Azza wa Jal. And that's why when finally the believer gets to go back where he came from, where did he come from? The company of Allah. He's finally satisfied. And when you're satisfied, you use the word mutma'in. Allah says, Ya ayyatuha nafsul mutma'inna irji'i ila rabbiki. The satis satisfied soul, come back to your master. Why did he say come back? Because you were with him in the beginning. And now in this final stage of life, the first stage of life and the final stage of life are now meeting with each other because you get to go back to the same Rabb that in, in, in whose perfect company you were. SubhanAllah. How can you be ungrateful to Allah and you used to be dead and He brought you life inside of your mothers? Then He will give you death again. Thumma yumitukum, thumma is littarakhi. He'll give you a little bit of time and He'll give you death again. Thumma yuhyikum. Then He will bring you back to life again. Thumma ilayhi turja'oon. Then you will be taken back to Him. May Allah Azza wa Jal return us back to our Master in the most blessed of ways. Barakallahu li walakum fil Quran al Hakim. Wa nafa'ani wa iyakum bil ayat wa dhikr al Hakim. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you.